Hello and welcome. You're with Lisa Cherry on the Trauma Resonance Resilience podcast and it's such a delight to be here today. This is a live webinar which is a format that I've been doing for a number of weeks now during um, COVID-19 and um, it works really really nicely and you're just going to absolutely love today's guest. Um, we've already got people coming into the room um, and while I'm just um, introducing today's guest please do say hello in the chat so that we can see really where we are from I mean already the first person said hello uh, from the Canadian Mental Health Association and I think that that sort of sets the tone for this wonderful global conversation so if you want to say hello say where you are where you're based in the world in the country um, and then I can pick those up as we go along but first of all I just want to introduce today's guest who spent 24 years in the NHS working predominantly with individuals and families experience serious mental health difficulties five years as clinical network director a consultant clinical psychologist also visiting professor at Sunderland uh, clinical lead for the Department of Health Adverse Childhood Experiences Programme um, and oh, developed oh. the routine. Oh, I've had to really break this down because you have a oh, really oh, long bio. Oh, right, and oh, developed right. the routine inquiry about adversity in childhood known as REACH. Please welcome today Dr. Warren Larkin. Hello, everybody. Thank Brilliant. you for that introduction, Lisa. I'm just, I'm just to say, I'm, the, I'm former clinical lead for the Department of Health Adverse Child Experiences Programme. I don't think such a thing exists anymore. No. But I'm but sure we'll get on to that. Yes, we'll get on to that. We've got, um, oh, 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 everyone's going so quickly. Kent, uh, we've got Stockport, we've got uh, <laughs> Woohoo. Um, Warren and Lisa in the house. Um, <laughs> we've got Glasgow, we've got Leeds, um, Bristol, Cambridge, um, South Cumbria, as usual. Wigan. We've got Wigan. Wigan. Wonderful. My home town. <laughs> Dundee. I tell you what, the, the Scots, I always get loads of Scots come to uh, the webinars. They're fantastic. Um, but there's always people from across the whole country. And I just feel so, um, well, honoured, really, that people yeah, from definitely. everywhere want to come and be part of these, these conversations because they're not always easy conversations. Um, but they're certainly conversations that I think can cut quite deep. And we're talking about something today by the very nature of the role that you did have and the work that you have done known as REACH. Um, so that's quite a controversial, murky place on occasion. So I think that's somewhere we can, you know, we can go and hang out for a bit if you're right yeah, with that. Shed some light on that uh, possibly murky place. So I'm just adjusting my light in there. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> we do like analogy. But listen, I'm going to start with, because um, the idea today was that we were going to look at possibilities, impact and responses yeah. post COVID-19. And the format of today will be that we'll speak for about 40 minutes and then I'll open up for questions. Cause I think it's the point of rec having a live webinar cause this will go on the podcast, but of course is that people have the opportunity to actually ask you questions on the spot, which I think is a really nice. Um, exciting, yeah, it's exciting. Exciting. Yeah. So I think, I think you'll like this question as a kind of opener to get us, get us stuck in. Um, I was hopeful, but now I'm struggling as it seems that we're becoming more polarized with people using anger, shame and blame to try and change things. And that will actually prevent things changing for the better. I understand why people may be hurting, but how do we help the country heal so that it can move forward when neither side is communicating in a way the other can hear? I've been surprised by the constant angry tweets from people who know anger, shame and blame do not work. And they forget to connect with the person. So I think that's a really interesting question that encompasses all of that stuff really around possibilities, impact and responses. But I guess her main question is how do we help the country heal so that it can move forward? Mm. <clears throat> I'm, just, I'm interested in, <clears throat> excuse me, the two sides that are referred to. I'm kind of trying to work out what those two sides are. Yeah, um, 
I'm not sure either, but I know uh, that the country was very much coming from that place before the <clears> pandemic. <throat> so it's not surprising really that we're still in a very polarised way of yeah. doing things. How do we, so how do we, help, how do we help the country here? It's a fascinating question. Um, I mean, there are different points of view on that, you know, in terms of some academics feel and believe that there isn't a particular upsurge in need or demand. So for mental health problems, for example, um, and then you've got other people who, you know, World Health Organization, United Nations, Centre for Mental Health, Young Minds, et cetera, et cetera, who, you know, providers of mental health services, who tell us that there's a, an upsurge in demand for mental health services. Um, and then also you've got to look at the, the spike in domestic abuse and violence. Uh, we know that following pretty much every uh, global disaster, um, <clears throat> there is always an upsurge in family violence. Um, we got to look at the fact that before the pandemic happened, so most of the services that I work with, and I'm sure you know lots of the people relate to this, were already saying that they couldn't meet demand for services, you know, for vulnerability, for people who've got vulnerability of whatever kind. And other services are raising the threshold, you know, seemingly every every other month it gets harder and harder to access services. So my my conclusion is that we have got a problem. Uh, looming in our society. Um, we already know that half the population are affected by childhood adversity and 10% of the population say they've had four or more adversities in childhood and we know that at the population level consequence of that is far-reaching in terms of physical health, mental health and social outcomes. So I mean when you add all that together and then the final layer is the, the kind of workforce situation in, in kind of um, particularly in the NHS, but also in police and in uh, teaching and in criminal justice. The workforce situation is, is an exponentially worsening downward curve. You know, well, it's not even a curve, it's, a, it's more of a, a slope. Um, so my other worry on top of all of those things we've talked about is if the workforce takes a hit, you know, if we have certain people who are working in frontline services right now, um, are affected adversely by these, you know, by having to be under such pressure and making possible decisions and, you know, the threat and worry of being exposed to the virus and taking it home to the families and seeing death and loss and, you know, being under immense pressure. You know, you're going to have a, I, I believe you're going to have a percentage of people who, who think, I don't think I can do this job anymore. I think I've kind of had enough of it. Um, so I think when you add all that together, what we have got is a, is a psychosocial potential for a psychosocial crisis in terms of we've dealt with the immediate pandemic and the, you know and the kind of the kind of incidence of the virus seems to be decreasing but in terms of psychosocial consequences of all of those things on our society I can't see things getting better I can only see them getting harder and then if you add on another layer which is recession and poverty I think I think we're going to be in a bad place unless we start planning for that on a cross-sector, multi-agency basis, on a national basis, over the medium and long term. I'm going to pause there. This is something that I need to take a breath about and let, and let us explore a bit more before, before I just carry on. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I agree with you. And I suppose, like, I'm sure lots of people listening, just so many things were whizzing through my brain. One of them was that that awareness about what frontline workers were going to need was one of the reasons why after I'd got over my shot, I wanted to step up and offer some something, you know, it's where the webinars have come from. It's where, you know, really low cost training came from to ensure that people, I, I mean, I did a 21 day self care thing as well, live every morning. Um, it, you know, it was that kind of gut knowledge that, it's that thing that happens post community trauma of how do we help each other? And I guess we started off thinking about being polarized and I guess that might be because there will be some people who are very much attached to that idea. And I imagine most people who are here very attached to that idea about how do we help each other? We need to collaborate. How do we focus on relationships and connection and community building and all of those things that we know, um, and there will be other people who are not attached to that idea. And I guess that's the challenge, isn't it? Because 
some of those things that you're quite rightly raising have the opportunity to be mitigated to a degree if we do this well. Is that not yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, you know, just today, the World Health Organization, the United Nations, put out a paper. Well, I think it was, what day are we on? Yeah, it was, it was last week or something, but they've put out a briefing paper on the kind of need for action on mental health. And really, that, that talks about not just about the impending crisis and the, and the obvious increasing need that's happening already, but also about the opportunity for rebuilding, you know. And I think this is a really important part of the conversation is that <clears throat> we can't tackle problems of this magnitude in isolation, in mm. specialisms, you know. Um, it's a mental health issue. No, it's not a mental health issue. Or it, it's, a, it's a public health issue. No, it's not a public health issue. It's a social issue. No, it isn't. It's a medical issue. We, we can't, that isn't going to solve anything. You know, we need a collaborative approach across sectors, but also beyond the term of any single govern, government or administration. I think this is something we know that we can prevent poor mental health. We know that we can prevent child maltreatment. We know that we can prevent social inequalities. And we see pockets of good practice do just that all over the world. What we don't have is a long term vision because this idea that we need to move upstream is still extremely valid, but we need a 20 to 30 year vision. We need to see, okay, we can fix this to a large extent for the next generation, but we can't keep thinking in periods of two, three, four years, or even a five year plan. This is a generational issue. And I think, you know, for professionals who want, if you want to attract professionals into young people to come into the caring professions, a great kind of motivator is to say, look, within this course of your career, we could see a transformation in health and wellbeing in our country. That will be, you could see that in a generation. We could do that. We know what works. We know what prevents poor mental health, poor physical health, poor social outcomes, poor family outcomes. We know what those things are, but we just never have a policy cycle or an administration that commits beyond the term of a single, you know, a, a kind of four to five year period. <clears throat> so I think we need a long term collaborative approach that's cross sector, cross government, beyond a single administration, beyond probably beyond any single person on this call or on this webinar mm -hmm. something that's that that you know political parties non-governmental or governmental organizations um public sector organizations private companies everybody we commit long term to a plan mm -hmm. and that's pretty much what the <clears throat> un paper is saying you know that there's lots of pockets of good practice all over the world but what we need is a coordinated long-term vision that, and I think that's what's missing. You know, we get a new, we get a new government or a new um, CEO of an organisation and, and the strategy changes. But Warren, that's always going to be missing while there is ego. I mean, that's what it's about, isn't it? Because if I'm doing something really long term, then I might not see the outcome. So then it stops being about me and I've got a four year stint in government and I want to make sure that everyone knows that this was my paper or this was my piece of work or this was the thing, my legacy. Until we're in a situation where actually dealing with those things becomes more important than the ego of a person, we're going to be, that's a, that, that's a challenge until somebody is, is more able to put themselves to the background because they have that passion for creating change, then we're always going to have that. And that until that intersects with uh, the un a deeper understanding about interdependence, and I'm not sure we're there. I think we're getting closer to interdisciplinary yeah. comprehensions around how we approach things. I mean, uh, things have got far more interdisciplinary with the introduction of neuroscience for example which draws upon a, a, a you know a range of disciplines we're looking at psychology sociology politics neuroscience and multi-agency there's always been stabs over the 30 years i've been working in public sector there's always been stabs at multi-agency to varying degrees but an understanding that we are interconnected and we need to be interdependent. I'm not sure yeah, yeah. that we're as close to that as we are to the other things. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, I think there's two things that, that stand out for me in all of this. You know, one is this notion of prevention. So there's two things that I think go together for this, you know, to think about a long-term solution. One is the notion of prevention. You know, we can prevent. For, in lots of cases, there are studies that explain to us how we could potentially prevent poor mental health, for example. 
in a significant proportion of the population if we were able to mitigate and prevent some of the contributing factors such as child abuse, neglect, violence at home, you know, parental substance misuse, um, parents going to prison and, and kids being left behind without that role model. Um, so we know if we can mitigate that and we can reduce some of those things, we can see better outcomes for people. We know that around 30, 33% of cases of psychosis could be prevented if we could stop young people being exposed to childhood sexual abuse. You know, the studies explain to us the contribution that those kind of experiences make. And we also know that parenting interventions and things like that can reduce the incidence of child maltreatment in areas where they've been made universally available. So I think that's, you know, that's a part of it. Um, so I don't think prevention's properly understood. Um, I think politicians certainly don't understand what prevention means genuinely. You know, it's mentioned in the, you know, the, the long term NHS plan, but there's very little evidence of anybody investing in genuine preventative interventions at the moment. You know, even health visiting. Um, when I was working in the NHS as clinical director for children's services, we were investing in health visiting. You know, we were recruiting as many health visitors as we could. And we knew they were doing amazing preventative work on a public health uh, landscape. But then we, they, they, you know, health visiting went to public health. There was a 40% budget reduction and then health visitors could barely do what they were mandated to do. Uh, never mind do the community asset building and the resilience building and the sort of, you know, the good, um, the good work they do kind of um, maintaining public health. So I'm not seeing a lot of evidence of people, you know, investing in, in prevention. And I think the understanding of it is genuinely not very good. Um, and then couple that with, this this issue that what we're dealing with is a very complex set of social and psychological issues you can't do that in isolation and in specialisms you have to do it in collaboration and co-production so i think I've, I've seen one example of where this has worked really well um so in 2015 norma lamb convened the children's mental health oh, i think it was called the children's emotional health and well-being task force in 2015 and I was fortunate to be a part of that group. And what we had was essentially a mandate from the government and a promise of some funding to come up with a rethink on, on children's emotional health and wellbeing services and the way they're organised and delivered in the country. Um, and it was over the course of a year and it, it was cross-sector representation. Um, and it was, a, it was a really formative experience for me. I, I saw that if you get the right people together across really varied stakeholders, and you give them permission to come up with something, that they come up with some amazing ideas. And then the report, the Future in Mind report, that was the product of that exercise, was then released into the world, and each, each locality in, in England was told to have a children's transformation board. So, so a multi-agency forum at high, with high-level representation that would then interpret that report and the recommendations in it and work out how they would make it so manifest it locally i know they would spend the money that was being provided to support those recommendations and in lancashire i saw for the first time all of the relevant stakeholders in a room at a very senior level tackling some of the most difficult problems that have been around for years you know like out of hours response for children you know with mental health problems i mean in lancashire we had eight ccgs three councils and it was it's massively complex but we tackled some of those some of those really tricky tricky and wicked problems that we'd have that we've had around for years that we could never really make a dent in so so that combination of having the right people the permission the mandate and de developing the trust uh, in those local forums we, we did some amazing you know we contributed to some amazing changes in Lancashire for young people and families and now they've got an all age eating disorder service that's the same across the whole of Lancashire so we can do it we can yeah. do it yeah let's talk about a little bit about ACEs um, and not everyone on the call might know what those are so we'll we'll get explicit about that in a minute but did you watch um, what's the matter with Tony Slattery oh god yes I did now I don't know about you but I'm watching that and his his whole embodiment, his whole the whole shape of him, said to me that something had happened to him that was violating. Um, I was fascinated by 
uh, how that was somehow kind of brushed over that because the, 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 the survival strategies he'd employed to deal with that had overtaken exponentially the thing itself, it really highlighted how that gets lost not just for him as a person, even though he was clearly carrying it at the forefront, however much he kept saying he stuffed it down, it was very much at the forefront. But I was really fascinated by the focus on, on alcoholism, the focus on getting a label, the focus on all these other things that enable everybody involved actually to not talk about the one thing that people don't want to talk about, which is child sexual abuse. And I, I found that that program really unpicked that uh, very, very well. And, and, you know, it's very uh, connected to the conversation that we're having around prevention and around mm -hmm. how we might ask different questions at a much earlier stage so that the survival strategies to cope with those things that happen do not become so big that you that the other thing is lost lost yeah. in translation yeah i mean i watched it the other night and i was close to tears when i watched it and um, yeah. i'm still troubled by it to be honest i feel so sad for, for this you know you saw pictures at the beginning of the program when he was kind of on whose line is it anyway and he, he's this vibrant handsome you know kind of confident appear apparently confident young man who's in the prime of his life and then you see him fast forward uh, to the present and he's been he just looks like he's been through so much pain you know and he's almost unrecognizable um mm -hmm. and you instantly know that this guy's been through something you know that he's, that he's had a very very difficult and challenging few years i mean that's obvious for everybody to see but what what disturbed me about that whole thing well when it came on i thought wow hopefully this will be one of those programs that really informs and educates and illuminates the public about mental health issues and, and what a humane and appropriate response and you know all of those things so i had high hopes and then ultimately it turns out to be an exercise in, in medicalizing someone's distress, you know. Um, I was deeply disappointed with the so-called world leader expert in bipolar mood uh, issues. Uh, I'm not using the word disorder because I don't, I don't think it's necessarily appropriate because I think given what he told us, given what he told us about his sexual abuse at the age of eight, the fact that he's in pain and been, been distressed and been having mental health issues for so long, for me, is totally understandable. Um, the fact that he wasn't able to tell anyone, you know, the fact that nobody in, you know, four decades of mental health service involvement, that he wasn't asked what happened to him. You know, why, why are you in so much pain, Tony? Why do you feel like you need to subdue your feelings with drink and, and medication? What, what happened and when did it start? For me, that is an evidence-based approach to assessment. So if someone comes to me for mental health help, then my assumption is that I need to understand all of the possible factors that might contribute to that person's mental health issues. And if I know the evidence says that a high proportion of people that are going to come to me for that help will have experienced adversity or trauma, then a diligent and sensible approach would be for me to ask them in a sensitive way in an appropriate way in the context of my assessment what happened to them how many people because you worked for 24 years around serious mental illness i mean yeah. what percentage of people would you say and i realize this is a very um kind of difficult question to answer because there'll be lots of people who didn't ever disclose anything but what sort of percentage of people would you say you were working with who um you felt hadn't experienced um an an ace should we say because we can experience traumas can't we that aren't necessarily um you know we might have a very difficult birth we might have problems um prenatally you know there are things that can happen um but in terms of an uh, thinking around family dysfunction household dysfunction um what percentage of people do you think and I can't remember if I asked you had or hadn't now. I think so, you said yeah, hadn't. Hadn't. Yeah. So what, what, what would your view be on that, just out of interest? So I, I worked as a 
a therapist for like as a day to day, you know, therapist for about 20 years. And um, I, I can't think of anybody <laughs> that didn't have one of those experiences or something, you know, similar in their history when we talked about it. Um, now, that doesn't mean that those things necessarily were always the reason for people coming to get help. Well, they were always there in the story somewhere. Now, of course, memory, autobiographical memory is notoriously unreliable. So I could be completely biased, and I'm sure I am. But I, I don't remember it. I don't remember thinking, oh, that's strange. There's no understandable reason in someone's life history why they're you know, struggling. Um, usually there is a, a really understandable reason why someone's distressed. Um, I don't subscribe to this idea that people become depressed because they've got dodgy brain chemistry or faulty neurons or, you know, funny genes. Um, I don't believe that at all. I don't think I've ever worked with somebody where there wasn't an understandable reason why they became distressed or they struggled to cope. Mm. Um, and that's the thing about that program that upset me the most, that he yeah. disclosed that he'd been abused at the age of eight. And when he went back to the world expert on bipolar issues, the recommendation was, give up drinking and then everything will feel better. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have to say that's my experience as well. Um, there's usually something, um, but it's what that something might be because also it's something that uh, that particular person, how also how they've experienced the world. You know, it's that, it's that internal, it's what Gabor calls that internal, it's that wound, isn't it, that comes from what I bring and what happens and how those things interact and, the, and then the resources around that person when it's happening. And I think that level of complexity is a challenge for Western thinking. I think that's, that's part of the problem. That it's much easier to still sit in the mad, bad or sad way yeah. of viewing humans yeah and i think that's what we saw on that program what we had was you know the program as i understand it was the consultant on the program was a psychiatrist and the, all of the all of the people that were advising him on the program were medical doctors um professor Mull holland clearly had a, a more sensible approach when he talked to me about trauma therapy but it was very much a biomedical perspective on what he was going through and at the end, I was so disappointed that his, his world leading expert was not saying to him, look, it sounds to me, Tony, like you've been through something really painful and it's still troubling you clearly. Um, is that something you'd like some help with? But instead he was advised to stop drinking. And I just think we're living in a parallel universe. You know, we all, you know the, the question at the beginning talks about two perspectives. And I think that was an obvious one that, the, the biomedical perspective is very helpful for some things, you know, like this whole virus situation and how to contain it and how to look for a vaccine, etc. You know, that's very sensible and very helpful. But for most human problems that are psychosocial in nature, the biological perspective is not enough. So we need a biopsychosocial perspective, like Engels said years ago, that the biomedical model is inadequate in and of itself. What we need is a biopsychosocial perspective that takes into account that complexity and takes into account the holistic approach. You know, so that for me was an example of how a narrow silo perspective is usually inadequate for complex human problems. And had they opened themselves up to the psychosocial aspects and they had a more balanced perspective, they would have asked him about his electronic mood diary and you know what medication he was taking and how much alcohol drinks but i've also asked him what happened to him and what that meant to him does it still trouble him you know is that part of the reason that he uses alcohol you know to numb that pain does he have intrusive memories of what happened does he feel guilt does he feel shame does he feel that it was his fault you know i'm not saying they should have gone into those things on the program but you would have liked to have seen some evidence that those things were balanced and and we didn't see that unfortunately no um and i guess there is that whole kind of area of discomfort in having those difficult conversations um that we've seen with a variety of 
um, communications around ACEs, for example. I mean, what you've just described sounds to me like a very uh, quite normal, uh, compassionate discussion and observation in the context of somebody coming and seeking help. Right, so let's get that right. This is in the context of somebody coming yeah, and seeking help. help. This is not, yeah. We're not in the post office. No, we're not giving people advice they've not asked for. Exactly, okay. you're having that conversation and, and I think one of the things that's been very prevalent in the discussions around um, ACEs as a model is how people have taken those kind of questions and used them in isolation of that conversation as yeah. somehow a screening tool. And that this, is, this has happened a lot more in the States, I think, than here. Yeah. Uh, but it's raised a lot of concerns about how we have those conversations and how we use that knowledge and understanding around adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think things are calmer now because of Felitti himself, I think, did a video quite recently saying this was never the intention. It was not meant to be like this. And I think that really helped people. <clears throat> but it would it would be um it wouldn't i would need to ask you your view on that really and how you think that happened and where are we at with that <coughs> well robert ander i've not seen the fleeting response but um robert Maybe ander, it was robert ander well he did a paper recently um basically saying look we we did this study years ago 20 years ago we used a research methodology we used a research tool and this tool's been elaborated and and you know, um, it's evolved over the years and the World Health Organization have a version of it, etc. But it was never intended as a clinical tool, as a diagnostic or as a, a kind of risk assessment tool. And he's basically just clarifying that what you find at a population level, which, which might be really reliable over time across the world, across socioeconomic groups, we still find the same dose response relationship between the amount of adversity someone experiences and their outcomes at a population level. Mm -hmm. um, I think what he was trying to point out was that on an indiv individual level, the number of ACEs someone's experienced tells us virtually nothing about what we can expect to see in terms of their outcomes. Because of exactly what we talked about a minute ago, the assessment needs to be idiosyncratic. The assessment needs to be holistic and it needs to be based on an understanding of an individual what they've been through in terms of adversity, but what also they've got in terms of assets and resilience. So I think he was trying to make the point that anybody that thinks they can use a, a checklist questionnaire and then assign some kind of risk or decide what kind of service they need as a response is scientifically and clinically not very valid. I totally agree. You know, for years I've been training people, professionals to ask about adversity in the context of an assessment. And we use a questionnaire, not because we're interested in the number, but because a questionnaire provides some structure for people. And very often when you provide someone with a questionnaire and you explain it, there are some benefits to that because people can say, okay, um, I'm surprised to see that these things are listed on this questionnaire. That suggests to me that other people have been through these things as well. And you go, well, yeah, it's pretty common actually all oh, right I, I thought it was just me that had been through those things so that's one reason the question is useful the other reason is that it provides consistency so between professionals if you put 100 professionals in a room and you give them some training on how to ask about adversity if you teach them a verbal method or a semi-structured method of asking about adversity you'll see a hundred different approaches mm. everything from so um can you tell me how your childhood was? Well, oh, very good, let's move on. To someone who'll spend a considerable amount of time and ask some very detailed questions. So it also removes or cuts down on unnecessary and unhelpful variation in practice. And then the third benefit, I think, is that people who don't want to say the words, who are not ready to explain or say what's happened to them, can simply put a yes or a no on a piece of paper and go, look, at I want you to know I've been through these things, but I don't really want to talk about them, which is fine as well. And the fourth benefit is that actually for some people, um, you can say you've had, well, I've had four of those things and they are affecting my life, but I don't want to talk to you about which they are or what happened. So it provides structure, it provides options and it provides choice. But the important thing is, there's no score involved, you know. This is not a scoring exercise. This is not screening. 
this is not trying to assign risk or relative need based on a number. Numbers are irrelevant. We don't ask for a number. We don't add it up. It's a prop. In my world, it's just a prop. It's just a way of providing a structure around a conversation um, that makes it easy for people to tell, you know, indicate what's happened to them. Mm. So, but I think, there are, I think there are some, you know, there are some, I hear the occasional story about some organisations that maybe don't get that, don't understand that nuance and that subtlety and think that the number means something on an individual level, which clearly it doesn't because, you know, if you've been, bullying is not even on the ace questionnaire, but if you've been bullied, you know, I don't know how many serious incident reviews I, re, I, I looked at when I was in the NHS and pretty much all of them indicated, you know, if there was a child who'd attempted suicide or, or unfortunately completed suicide, very often bullying was involved. So that's one experience, if it's a yes or a no, but that doesn't tell you how it severely it impacts on someone's life. Mm. You know, and yeah. bereavement, of course, child bereavement, yeah, yeah. Isn't yeah. There, which is, but um, I just, I think I was quite fascinated at the time at the level of anger around uh, thinking about ACEs and it led me to think about all sorts of things really. I mean, at one point I found some of the academic conversations and I, I'm, I like a good article as much as the next person, you know, I like to think academically about things. Um, but there was such a rage around the topic that I felt that some of these more detailed conversations that would have actually helped a lot of people were not being had. Certainly in the in the Twitter sphere, there was a lot of rage I felt around, yeah. which which stopped deeper conversations. Yeah, um, that help us understand the nuance. It is. This is nuanced. It is nuanced, and it's. What I'm trying to get across is that this, for me, is a part of a thorough holistic assessment when someone's asking for help. So that's very different to screening. Screening is we take a whole population who are well, who appear well. They're not asking for help. They seem to be healthy. But we can predict that some of them will have this certain problem. And if we can intervene early enough, we might be able to help them. And the assumption is also that you can immediately give them an evidence-based response. So like screening for prostate cancer or whatever. Um, that is not what we're doing. What we're doing is asking, for, you know, asking people who have already sought our help because they're already having some problems. And then we're then giving them the choice to talk about what's happened in their lives and, and then to tell us whether or not they think it's affected them and whether or not they feel like they need any help with it. So for me, that is a thorough and sensible assessment in the context of groups of people who are seeking help already for problems that they're already having and we're just trying to do the best we can to find you know understand the picture so that it can give them the, you know the best kind of help mm -hmm. um, what we saw with tony slattery's case is that he's not been through that process and he's been assessed multiple times presumably in, in mental health services and what's not happened is someone's asked him about an appropriate holistic assessment that takes into account some of the things that we know contribute to mental health issues for some people, which is adversity or, or childhood abuse in his case. Instead, he was given a diagnosis and medication. Mm -hmm. So for me, that demonstrates that what he, what he got was a biomedical response rather than a biopsychosocial response, which is a holistic assessment to what he might have been through. Mm. Oh, I feel he was let down. I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, I have someone very close to me who has spent five years trying to get a full assessment, has had no assessment and walks away with actually a prescription addiction now. And I find that absolutely heartbreaking because um, we have we've still got a long distance to travel, even though you've clearly been on that journey in a in in medical settings um for some time and you know it's a long it's a long wave isn't it yeah yeah that's why i'm so passionate about asking people about adversity as part of your assessment process in services that are helping people because i just think you know for example if he'd if he presented to his gp for the first time when he was in his 20s and his GP had said to him, so when did you first start to feel this way? You know, have you any idea why 
you're in, you know, emotional pain. Has anything happened in your life that's been difficult or, or stressful or has anything bad happened? And then even further, give them a questionnaire and said, do you, do you identify with any of these things? You don't have to talk to me about them, but I'd like to know if any of these things are relevant to you because for some people they can be. And if that's the case, maybe there are the kinds of help that we can offer you. He might have saved, you know, that might have saved him 30 years of pain, you know. But Warren, so we do the full assessment. We assess that the kind of wraparound package you're going to need is going to involve some group work, some one-to-one -one talking therapy, and maybe it'd be really good to do something creative because that would be really helpful, something rhythmic, repetitive and somatic. Then what happens uh, when, of course, those things aren't available i mean and and that is a question i'm asked yeah. all the time i'm sure it's a question you are asked all the time yeah. and the people listening are asked all the time how That's do we right. how do we you know how do we square that hole well there's two i think there's two responses to that one is whenever i do in my practice whenever i work with the team and i'm trying to help them and train provide training and support in asking about adversity before we even meet there's a period of a couple of months beforehand where we prepare, where we do some readiness work and we look at, have they got supervision in place? Have they got um, appropriate safeguarding support? Have they got a place to record this properly? What Do they know what resources are available locally? Mm. What resources they've got internally within the team? Um, how long are they going to be able to work with someone? So... Part of, part of the deal is, yeah, you must know what's available for people who might say, do you know what? Yeah, this is relevant to me and I do want some help with it. Uh, my particular issue is bereavement and loss or my particular issue is um, I was physically abused when I was a child or I'm in a, an abusive relationship. No, you know, so you have to know what, what's available for people who do want help. But the other important thing is, you know, in all of the, the evaluations that have been done on um, targeted or routine house inquiry, that I've been involved in, what you tend to see is the majority of people who say, yeah, thanks for asking me about that. It is relevant and I've, I've had some experiences. The vast majority of people want the person that they've told to say, thank you, I believe you. Hmm. I appreciate what you've told me. That was a big deal. Thank you for trusting me. And we can come back to that again if you want to. We can talk more about it. You don't have to go into details now. But I want you to know that I'm here if you want to explore that a bit further. Would that be something that's helpful? Or we could get you some other kind of help. But let's come back and talk about that again next time we meet. For, for most people, having a validation from a professional that they see as a person that they trust, someone in high esteem, you know, that validation, that acceptance and that being believed is a really big deal for a lot of people. You know, and there's, there's inherent therapeutic value in unburdening these deepest darkest secrets that some people carry around for years like Tony Slattery did um, and then being heard by a professional who validates you. Mm. That's, that's really he didn't, important. He didn't get that did he? He didn't really get he, that. No, he didn't no. really. It was, it was danced around and it was, uh, it, was, it was noted. Was he met where he was with real compassion and empathy? No. He didn't look like that. No, it was a very strange scenario. I imagine the cameras and everything, but I think, you know, what he needed was to be heard and to be validated and to be listened to. And potentially if the opportunity arose in that conversation to say that wasn't your fault, Tony. Yeah. But I don't think that the doctor wasn't compassionate. Or no, not at all. It wasn't personal. It was just no. that the, the ability to articulate that level of connection that's required that does that unburdening, I just think was just not present. And I don't think that was his fault. I no, think. I think it's an artificial scenario, but I think what, mm. what most people want and need is to be validated and heard. And if possible, if, if, it, if the conversation goes that way, to be able to say to somebody, you know what happened to you, not because of you. You know, that wasn't your fault, you were eight. What could you have done? You know, and that whole thing about self-blame is one of the most destructive aspects of trauma. When people blame themselves, it's really hard to get better. It's really hard to move on from it. So I think in answer to your original point, you know, there is some real due diligence to do about knowing what's available for people if they want yeah. help. But there's also, we need to appreciate that actually for a lot of people, they don't want or need to be referred on for 20 sessions of psychotherapy. Most people that we want 
that want to have that validation from a professional. But also, I often find that the things that build resilience, the things that people want and need are what we might describe as social assets or social prescribing in GP's language. You know, being connected with other people, um, feeling a part of something, not being isolated, having something meaningful to do where they feel a connection and they feel a sense of self-worth and self-esteem as a result of it. Mm. Having safe relationships they can rely on, you know? So a lot, I think a lot of the responses that people want when they talk, when they disclose adversity are that validation, that connection and that human response. They're not, most of the time, they're not asking for medication or treatment of any kind. And for those and that, small that ties into Tim's, I'm going to stop yeah, okay. going to questions yeah. in a minute, but that ties into Tim's comment here, which is something that we've talked probably about on every um, uh, webinar that we've done through this, is that what we don't want to be doing is pathologizing very normal human distress of yeah. what's going on currently. Yeah. And I think it's really important that we throw, throw that into the space. But I'm going to dive into questions, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so here we are then please may i ask you both now i haven't read these first already i should okay, stand okay. read really okay. please may i ask you both to comment on the views expressed in social media posts and tweets that the covid19 pandemic is the 11th ace surely a pandemic is not an ace as defined by feliti and a study the adults reaction to it that it might or might not become an ace some families and children seem to be thriving under lockdown as they're more socially and emotionally connected do you want to answer Ooh, that yes that's a fascinating question a good one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah uh, i think <clears throat> undoubtedly there are a lot of young people and families that are experiencing adversity at the moment you know whether it be domestic abuse whether it be neglect whether it be parents who are maybe using drugs and alcohol to cope or you know being cut off from the usual sources of support um is is the, is this whole epidemic an adverse child experience well you could argue it either way couldn't you you know i certainly think for lots of families and lots of young people this is going to be the defining event in their life you know this summer will be the defining event for a whole generation of people and we know from the data that there are lots of people experiencing horrible things because they're stuck at home in abusive situations or they're facing, you know, poverty and they're, and they're afraid or they've lost the job, or whatever. So I think there's a lot of adversity happening. And I think given that services could barely cope beforehand, uh, that is worrying me. Uh, and even for the children and families that are not going through something abusive or traumatic, this whole episode provides a huge amount of uncertainty. It's understandable to be frightened. It's understandable to be anxious. It's understandable that your sleep might be suffering. It's understandable to be perhaps a little bit, you know, um, on the obsessive and compulsive spectrum. If, if that's kind of your tendency, I imagine the situation right now is not helping at all. So yeah, they're, they're my initial thoughts on the situation. I think the, the, the virus and the pandemic are creating the conditions for people to experience more adversity. Mm. And I suppose I would just throw into that, you know, a pandemic highlights your vulnerabilities and your robustness and the um, social injustices that people have, uh, were already facing are, once you have a pandemic almost collide with that, yeah. Uh, then, then yes, I think we are going to see huge adversity. Is it the eleventh phase? I'd put child bereavement before that if we were going to start adding, adding stuff in, personally. But I think in terms of what the environment that it creates for people yeah. who it are already, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're on, the, you know, if you're on the edge of the cliff when this happened, you're going to be the first to kind of fall off, um, yeah. or you might not be because there are people holding that space uh, yeah. and that's what we're after really aren't we i mean we have to look at the flip side you know that whilst there's going to be a huge amount of need generated by this situation and then another wave of need generated by a recession that follows <clears throat> there are also lots of people who have lots of resilience resources have lots of social support are not worried about money so much and they're thriving you know they've enjoyed lots of family time better social connections because they've been using video to talk to family and friends you know so there are you know there, there is a 
you know, there's a chunk of the population that have probably benefited from this, actually. Yeah. And we could also argue that as an as a accelerant, this, this whole situation is an accelerant both to adversity but also to growth for some people. Um, there probably are some social benefits for some people that we've, we've learned to communicate virtually better. We've learned that actually some families are benefiting from, from more flexible working that having parents at home more of the time because they're working from home is probably good for some families and that some employers probably recognize that they don't need everybody in the office all the time mm. actually it's better for everyone's mental health and, and lifestyle if they can be at home with their families more of the time so yeah. there is a and flip there's side those, there's all those children of course as well who who don't don't manage well at school whose schools have not been inclusive enough for those children um, I've heard lots of stories about lots of foster children who have now got really close relationships with their foster carers and that's made a massive difference. Mm. There's just so many stories to hold on. Yeah, there are. I think it's a huge period of change and I, mean, I heard the other day that one local authority has had unprecedented uh, applications for families who want to adopt and foster children, mm. which is a wonderful outcome from this situation that people are seeing that actually lots of children need a safe home and this has given them the time and space to maybe prepare themselves for that for that decision so yeah there are there are there's always there's always a balance isn't there but i do think coming back to where we started there will be increased need for people who are vulnerable who are having mental health issues who are having physical problems who are lonely and isolated um, and we'll see the consequences of those adversities play out over time. So I think we have to prepare for them now, rather than pretending that we're going back to business as usual, which is a myth. There, there is, is no business, business as usual that's gone. Mm. That's gone. But yeah, it's interesting. You hear people going, when we get back to normal, when we go back to, there is no back. That's not the way we develop. You know, we're, we've moved forward into something else. Uh, point here that fits in nicely with my view that we can only meet someone as deeply as we've met ourselves um, and anonymous attendees, but I don't think an individual who's not experienced such adverse experiences can genuinely know what or how suffering feels. I've been referred for psychological support and shocked my therapist. Is that adequate practice? I have to say, I've heard that uh, from a number of people where their story has actually, um, sat outside of the uh, capability to hold and listen to that story there could be a whole range of reasons for that not just that they hadn't experienced trauma but that they may not have done enough work on themselves they may be very young they may be only just trained you know there's a whole raft of reasons why that might be uh, so it's not really a question although the person is saying is that adequate practice um, I think you've touched on all the relevant points, Lisa. Um, but what I would say, sometimes as a therapist, you know, even after years of, you know, I, I work with people with psychotic-like experiences, unusual and distressing experiences for 20-odd years, and sometimes you do hear things that, that move you, you know, emotionally. And it's not that you can't hear it or you can't cope with it. It's just that you have a human response to it. And, and I always find that it's best to just be honest about that and say, that really moved me. I feel, you know, that, that, that was hard to hear, you know, um, I can hold it and I'm with you. And, and, but sometimes, sometimes having an emotional response is okay. It's authentic. You just have to be honest about it. Yeah. Um, however, <laughs> having said that with proper training and supervision, you would know how to respond in a situation like that. And ultimately, what you don't want is a therapist that is kind of thrown off balance by what they've heard. Mm. You know, it's like going to a dentist who's squeamish, you know, you don't need that, do you? <laughs> you want somebody who inspires you with a bit of confidence, you know? Yeah. So th there's a balance to be had there. And I'm sorry to hear that, that if that wasn't, mm. you know, if that wasn't a great experience, but what we do know is the way people respond to disclosures is a huge part about whether has a huge part to play in whether people go on to seek help and, and explore that further. If they don't get a good response, people think, well, I'm not going to do that again. That was painful. That was a risk that didn't turn out very well. And it so, can feed yeah. into that narrative, I think, of I'm too much. 
I'm too much. No one can bear me. No one can hear what I've got to say. And there is that story, I think, is very tightly attached to different types of childhood trauma. You know, yeah, I'm yeah. not enough or I'm too much. You know, it's that both sides of that same coin. So if you if you are approaching somebody and you that's already your story, then you'll spot somebody feeding into that quite quickly. Oh, definitely. And I think that's why it's important. I always say at the beginning, look, we ask everyone these questions. It's quite common for people to tell us about difficult things like that in their life. Uh, we know it can affect your well-being later on. So we ask everybody. So these, some of these things might be relevant to you and some might not, but we make a point of making sure we ask everyone about this because it's not unusual. Um, you want people to know that it's, it's okay and it's something we expect to talk about, you know. So what we do know is if you don't explicitly offer that conversation, people don't voluntarily tell you. You know, mm. people don't disclose their deepest, darkest secrets unless they're invited to do so in a safe space. So I think that, you know, the burden of responsibility is on us as professionals to, to make that opportunity possible for people. Well, I'm going to ask one more question. There's actually two questions, but they are very similar. So I'm just going to ask, ask, them, ask them once through the lens of Tim, um, who's put, if we're predominantly still entrenched in a biomedical understanding of mental health, and are not thinking about prevention or promotion from a biopsychosocial spiritual coupled with a lack of political will to address social determinants. Oh, you're wordy, Tim. How do we create a social movement for change? Now, that's, that's um, uh, my favourite question then. How do we create a social movement for change? Well, yeah, there's a lot in that, isn't there? Um, <laughs> I think... <sighs> I think we are creating a social movement for change, you know? Um, so when I started working in the NHS, I started working at Presswich Hospital, which was an asylum. I saw that th actually containing people away from the rest of society and using drugs to treat them and to contain them was not working. So I, I then spent the rest of my career working on the theme of trauma and adversity and mental health and, and trying to prove and demonstrate that actually, what people need is to, is to make sense of and talk about what's happened to them, not to be drugged and, and kept away from everybody else. Yeah. So that social movement, when I started working on it with lots of other people, um, was very controversial. But now it's broadly accepted as being sensible. And you'll see that there's lots of people writing and talking about it and campaigning about it and publishing research on it. And there's now a whole load of evidence that says, you know, serious mental health problems are not the consequence of inherited genes and, and funny brain chemistry they're usually in in part at least down to things that happen to people significant trauma adversity abuse things like that not always but very often so that's a social movement that's already working you know we're already making a lot of progress in that area but we still have a you know we still have a way to go um <clears throat> what else can we do we can write about it we can talk about it we can make films about it we can be creative about it we can have conversations and educate other people. Um, and that's the purpose of this webinar. I mean, when we yeah. think about social change, I mean, from, from my perspective, and I'm 50, so I've been working around this for 30 years, I feel like I'm in the shift. I may not actually get to see the shift, I don't know, but I feel like I'm part of that wave and I feel really humbled by that, I have to say. But part of that social movement comes from having conversations like this and each person listening to this conversation going off and having that taking that intention that we intention and rippling that out into all of the spaces and places that we go yeah absolutely agree lisa it's, it's an influencing job isn't it you know we're all agents of change you know we're all we all have the potential to create change and to influence others and we just got to see every opportunity we can and educate convince and get i think i've spent my career trying to get people to think about and care about the stuff that i care about that that's it in a nutshell you know whether it's writing a book or writing a research paper or speaking at a conference or doing a blog or appearing on, on a webinar or a podcast it's all relevant you know talk to your mp talk to your friends talk to your family um recommend books whatever it is um, i just think we're all influencers and We've come a long way, you know, if you think about it. We didn't used to talk about suicide. 
because we thought it would make things worse. But no, it's seen as a, a, a sensible first part of your conversation if you're working with somebody who's got a mental health issue. You know, have you had suicidal thoughts? That's something that bothers you. If it does, make sure we, we can talk about it. Um, years ago, we used to think that talking about psychotic type symptoms like hearing voices and all of that, uh, we shouldn't do that. We thought that was a bad idea because it would just make it worse. Of course, we know the opposite is true. No. So we are, we're making loads of progress. You know, this whole ACES movement, while there's con controversy about it, ultimately what it's done is demonstrated to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people now who, who support these ideas that actually when bad things happen to people, that can have an impact across your life. And it's not all about your genes, not all about your brain chemistry or your, um, you know, the way that you've been put together. We know there's a better emphasis on the fact that when bad things happen to children and young people, it leaves its mark, you know. So the ACES movement, for all its controversies and, and kind of nuance uh, sometimes lost, I think is a good thing because it highlights the fact that if we can prevent bad things happening to people, which is ultimately a social problem, then we can have better outcomes for the next generation. So for me, it's a very hopeful movement. It's a very hopeful cause to be a part of. Warren Larkin, it's been great talking to you. Thank you so much. I hope everyone listening has really enjoyed themselves. I'm sorry we didn't have time for more questions, but I think you'll all agree that was a really uh, stimulating conversation. Thank you very much, Warren. Take care. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. It's been a pleasure.